Hello, I'm Jane Jenkins. I am the CEO and executive coach at Churchill Leadership Group. Churchill is a global organization who partners with companies with a global footprint to bring them organizational leadership and team development solutions. We're going to talk today about human intelligence. We've all heard about artificial intelligence, but what about human intelligence? So often we work together with people in our day job causing conflict assumptions, we're not on the same page, and such a need for individuals to really connect with each other, to be more productive, to enjoy their jobs more, and to continue to grow and collaborate around the globe to perform more effectively. So human intelligence, we'll touch on emotional intelligence, conversational intelligence, natural talents and strengths to empower you to be a more effective leader and team. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so that you can reach that next level of clarity focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Today, we're going to be taking an inside look at why when you're looking at your growth and development as a leader, you may have been looking in the wrong direction. Remember, you can chat about this episode or any of our episodes uh, on our new Facebook community, Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast inside Facebook. Just go there, search it out, and go chat about this episode or any past episodes with follow, fellow listeners. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. You're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into podcasts. We always need your help in staying relevant, so please go over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. You can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, where you can find us all the way from Wisconsin, well, to Florida, which is kind of interesting today. <laughs> um, you can also check us out on Roku TV, where there's over 100,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular listener, a big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners every show. With an, we're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc., magazine as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. You can also catch us on Google Home and Alexa by simply saying, play Dog Baron Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, strap yourselves in. Let's get, let's strip it down and die right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, C-suite leader, or a leader in some other capacity, almost every show, I challenge you to grow and develop yourself. But if you're a regular view and a regular listeners to us, is there, we want to question, is there a more effective way to grow and develop yourself as a leader than just simply looking at where your faults are? Well, according to our guest today, the answer is a very resounding yes. Jane Jenkins is the CEO and executive coach at the Churchill Leadership Group. She's the, she is a Fortune 500 leadership veteran for multiple companies, including Exxon. Over 23 years, Jane refined her team development and leadership capabilities and built sales teams responsible for delivering over $600 million a year. Jane Jenkins has also been a successful in marketing, operations, strategic planning, organizational development. Today, Jane is the founder and CEO of, <laughs> of Churchill Leadership Group. Sorry, I had a little bit of a brain fart there. I'll uh, just knock the flatulence out of my coconut. Uh, <laughs> as a global professional development organizational provi providing strengths, accelerated solutions to corporations that need to increase organizational and, and leadership capacities. Um, it's, it's a, <laughs> 
I'm going to try that part again. We're going to go back. Um, Ren, let's start this again. Well, according to, <laughs> I can't again, three, two, one. Well, according to our guest today, the answer is yes. Jane Jenkins is CEO and executive coach at the Churchill Leadership Group. She is a Fortune 500 leadership veteran from multiple companies, including Exxon. Over 23 years, Jane refined her team development and leadership capabilities and built a sales team responsible for delivering over $600 million a year. Jane Jenkins has also been successful in marketing, operations, strategic planning, and organizational development. Today, Jane is the founder and CEO at Churchill Leadership Group, Inc., a global professional development organization providing strengths accelerated solutions to corporations that need to increase organizational and leadership capa capabilities, greater team effectiveness, and higher, this is important, employee engagement. The global Churchill team is made up of over 80 plus highly experienced certified executive coaches who also have extensive real world su successful leadership experience. Churchill's clients include eBay, PayPal, LinkedIn, Electronic Arts, MX, and a bunch of other fantastic companies, including Roche and Nestle Health and many, many more. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome Jane Jenkins! <laughs> Welcome, Jane. Thank you, Darf. <laughs> really appreciate that enthusiasm. Good to have you here. Please forgive the uh, splutterings of a man who is recovering uh, from the travel bug that comes from uh, many long flights and layovers in foreign countries. I know you understand because I know you've done lots of that yourself. Yeah, you're forgiven. Totally understand. Yeah, I'm sort of, <laughs> but I'm all right now. <laughs> I used to be well, but I'm all right now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk a little minute about about you know I said at the beginning there that you have were a corporate executive. You were with many um, high level, very high performing companies, uh, and then you broke away and you've done your own thing. So let's talk a little bit about about being at that level inside of those Fortune 500, uh, top, even better than that, companies. Um, how did you get your start? The start world? with Churchill or the start in the corporate? No, in the corporate world. You know, it's interesting. It seems such a lifetime ago. It's probably over 30 sure. years ago now. And um, it's a really silly story. When you were 12. Right. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> when I left university and I was at the University of Aston in Birmingham, England, and I never forget, and it was really this simple because you know nothing at that age. I was 21. I'd done a chemistry degree. I'd finished that. I'd done started some work at Exxon at that time. And I never forget, and this sounds ridiculous, my, I'd used my mom's car and my mom's car was pretty much failing. Most of my money as in my part-time jobs was going on fixing this car, what felt like every few months. So I remember thinking, you know what? I need to get a really good job and I have to have a car. And that was it. Mm -hmm. So when I started doing my research, speaking to colleagues, friends, family who were doing different areas, like I sort of recognized from my work with Exxon, although I did chemistry, I didn't want to spend all day in a laboratory. Right. Um, particularly confirming things versus really in innovative work that um, I decided to interview for pharmaceutical companies because I got a company car and it just oh. so happened that my natural talents, my personality, the like the way I like to move around all day really suited me. And I went into sales and my career progressed from there in different areas, both in Europe and in here in the U S for 23 years. So what was the pull to chemistry originally then? You know, it begs that question. Great question. I loved it in middle school. I loved it in high school. I loved it in sixth form college, which took me through the age of 18 doing A-levels. And I think a big part of it is the teachers were just so much fun and everything was very discovery mode. But it got to a lot of theoretical in university and was a lot drier. 
And mm. very quickly, I was like, eh, not sure I can make a career of this. Although I have to say, having that science background and that analytical, analytical view, particularly with clinical trials, really helped me because, of course, pharmaceuticals is, is very steeped in that. And the ability to articulate complex data in the healthcare world with, with physicians was key. So it helped. So so if it wasn't for your mother's crappy car, you'd have never gotten into pharmaceuticals. I might still be in a lab. Yes. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> so I got lucky. I got lucky. So you but you moved into you moved into sales, um, which again is a very different world altogether. So I mean, as I said at the beginning there, you you've had a high positions in, in different areas. So was the one of those that really stood out for you that you know really engaged you because they they when I mean, you're talking about science you talked about analytics you talked about um, delivering analytical information and sales which is very personal you know so was there a piece that really stood out for you that pulled you yeah definitely you know i i got in 23 years between the work in europe and then the work here in the us to work both in the field in multiple roles as well as in the headquarters so i really did get to uh, experience firsthand working in strategic planning supporting a lot of the c-suite decisions um, working as a salesperson in the early days sales trainer running analytical teams um, in the marketing teams launching products like uh, crestor nexium the purple pill etc mm -hmm. and so the ones that stood out in answer to your question was where I was able to build the team that delivered and a mm -hmm. big part of that was in developing individuals and bringing people together to work as a highly high performing team over time right not just you know for a one-off for a launch but keep that sustainable performance going and I think that's what I recognized was my sweet spot the leadership and team development so in that context of, of recognizing your sweet spot, which I think is so often something that, that you know, we have a sense of, uh, you know, I think I'm really good at this, but there's a lot of, for most people anyway, there's a lot of uh, second guessing. You know, sure. I, I, for instance, I went to university, I did, I did chemistry, I did analytical uh, scientific stuff, and now this seems to be a different, how did you, was that a, a pull for you? Was that a, a dilemma of any kind to, you know, the contradiction of what I've studied, what I've done, and that this seems to be the same sweet spot. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because now I'm in the other shoes as a parent of an 18-year-old that's just started at UF. He's doing business. And so I have conversations with him that probably might, well, my parents never had with me around career and leadership and all this type of stuff. So I'm always looking for those glints of excellence and natural talent mm. in him to help um, not, not definitely not tell him what to do, but just to share observations to help him decide his career path. And, and really that's his journey, not mine. But, you know, you try and help as a parent. When I was in those shoes, like I was clueless. And I think I learned to find my niche in the early days just by doing experience. And, you know, when I come back to today and I think about the programs we do at Churchill, that's such a critical part of leadership and team development is the experiential learning. We can all read books. We can all watch webinars, podcasts. We can get information going in, but we truly learn the right way for us through doing and practicing and regrouping and reassessing. And I think that's really how I found my best path as in a career, along with then later on some of the assessments that I did that learned that mm -hmm. accelerated my self-awareness. Yeah, and that's one of the, you know one of the things that um, drives uh, companies crazy. But I actually really love it about millennials. Um, you know, you and I both work in the, in the same world of, of assisting companies and growing companies and building teams and all that kind of work. Um, and, and you know, their frustration with millennials who are changing careers and it, like that millennials change careers every four years. When your eye was entered the workforce, it was, what are you going to do for the next 20 to 40 years? Now it's, <laughs> right? what are you going to do for the next four as a career, not as a job. We thought about jobs maybe as being four, not careers. Um, but the wonderful thing is that millennials want to do different careers. They want to find, they, as you said, they want to get into it and say, yeah, not for me. And it's, and it's very interesting because I think that we have to re-examine the whole educational world and even the whole uh, school of thinking around 
school, around education, around university. Because like you said, asking somebody, you know, who's 18, what do you want to do? And thinking that that is a lifetime choice is crazy for millennials. They just Isn't it? love that. I love that about them, actually. Yeah. And I think uh, sort of to add to that, if I may, Dov, is the pace of the world, right? Of course. The pace of living, the way things moved in business, learning, technology, and everything was very, very different, obviously, 20, 30 years ago than it is today. So what a millennial potentially can achieve from a learning and deliverable perspective and experiential in four years might look very different to what I learned in four years. It might have taken me eight years early in yeah, my career because we, we didn't have the exposure to with people and information that they have today. So I think part of it is they can do that because of the speed of which they're able to move. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And that has become the foundation of what you do with your company, with Churchill. We talk about leading from strength. So let's talk about leading from strength for a moment, because very often we are looking at, we look at ourselves, particularly in the, you know, uh, one of the things I've spoken about many times on this show and I've written articles about it and, and other things is that more than 70% of high performing individuals. So we're talking about C-suite individuals are walking around with imposter syndrome. They're feeling like I'm not good enough. Or, you know, one day they're going to find out that I'm an idiot and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, and your focus is on strengths. And, and when we're in that imposter syndrome, we're feeling like our focus is on our weaknesses. Tell to us about the distinction between those two. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's such a, it's such a big, important question. And if I can just mm -hmm. back up a little, and Please. I think, you're, you're bringing up the imposter syndrome really speaks to this is I think in the last sort of three years, you know, as a coach, I'm always observing and noticing and um, looking for trends, especially is the mm -hmm. humanity of leadership. I really believe we don't give enough attention to human intelligence. You know, we talk about artificial intelligence, emotional intelligence, IQ and all this stuff. And I think the umbrella for me in the leadership business world is, human intelligence so what do i mean by that is even at those super successful leaders as you mentioned that look from the external side to everyone else like they're super performing they've got everything nailed they've really got their act together inside are still vulnerable human beings and that's mm -hmm. real i see that all the time when we coach executives it's real and a lot of us are obviously afraid to show that because we're expected to have all the answers at times but in reality, even millennials don't want a leader that has all the answers. They want someone that they can relate to, that can be a little vulnerable, and that builds trust. So I've been given a lot of thought in the last couple of years as I observe the needs coming in from more different corporate clients, and we see more of the mindfulness needed, which is yep. feeding more of the human soul and the human ability to cope in this crazy busy world we live in. We see more of a need of emotional intelligence because I may be a great tech leader, but the way I interact with people is not something I've naturally brought to the table. It's a technology that excited me. And now I'm higher up in the organization. I need help to relate to other people. We see Judith's work with conversational intelligence. And so if you think big picture about business, whether it's a nonprofit, government or corporation, most business is done through our interaction with other human beings. And so the humanity of human, the humanity of leadership or human intelligence is so, so important. And we can't start figuring out everyone else until we figured out me. Mm -hmm. We understand ourselves enough to be able to operate with other human beings and what we need to thrive and where we're at our best and where our sort of blind spots may be. And that's where I think the strengths piece comes in. We use, um, we use an assessment called Strengths Finder, which has 34 strengths themes we call it which are ranked based on taking the assessment it's a very proven assessment over 20 million people have taken it and if you think about it if you're ranked one through 34 you can't have 34 in your top five right mm -hmm. you're going to have a bottom five a bottom 10 you're going to have a top 10 and so yeah. we're all uniquely different and yes. i might i might become vulnerable or suffer from imposter syndrome because i do some of my strengths overdone and it gets away with me, gets a bit out of control with me and has a negative effect on other people. Or it might be because I'm struggling that I have a lack of talent in my bottom five and I don't know what to do. Either of those triggers might cause me to suffer from imposter syndrome and, and question mm -hmm. myself. That's human. 
Yes, of course. Do that. But by knowing my strengths, I can then look at the situation that I'm in, the where I may be suffering from imposter syndrome, decide what's causing it, like have a bit of analytics going on to figure out what, what's really going on with me, and then use my natural strengths at the top to help me work through it and, and deliver the best I can in that situation. So going back to your original question of like focus on our weaknesses versus focusing on our strengths. If you think about it, we live in a world where most of us are raised to fix what's broken. Mm -hmm. um, we have kids, right? So you, you have a kid come home, maybe in high school with, and it happened with our son, so I had a real Petri dish to test in, come home with like five or six A's and a C in English. Where does most right. of the conversation go? C in English. Exactly. And it was so hard for me and my husband, he's actually also certified as a strengths coach, to not spend our time talking about the C in English. So we right. tried to out for real what we do with corporate clients around focused on how did you get these A's and what was it about you and your work that created these A's, etc. Before you know it, he was applying the same principles of his authentic talent and his C became an A in English without us even going there. Because we focused on what was right with him and how we could do more of that. You know, and I think that that's a very important thing is that um, I, I, we do a lot of stuff on unconscious parenting and uh, focusing on what's right, right? Focusing on, um, you know, the, there's, a, there's a, a, a client of mine years ago, a corporate client of mine years ago, I was coaching him as a CEO, but in his, in his, as his hobby, um, he trains dogs. That's his hobby. Uh, and one of the principles that we both, we came to in a conversation was, I said to him, well, how do you train dogs? And he says, you know, he's talking to me about it. And I said, yeah, exactly. You reward the behavior you want and you pay less attention to the behavior you don't want. And he goes, yeah. He goes, bad trainers pay all their attention to, to the bad behavior and they punish the dog. But he goes, a good trainer puts all their attention on the good thing the dog does. And I go, that's how you train people. I love it. <laughs> right? I people love and dogs it. are exactly the same. Reward the behavior you want. <laughs> in marriages, in relationships, in, in, with your par parenting, reward the behavior you want. Uh, because otherwise you're, you're working from the fragility of the human being rather than the strength of the human being. And that is what, so, you know, what I love about Strength Finder, as you know, through De our, our common friend, Darren, yeah. um, you know, um, that focus of looking in on what's strong. But at the same time, I want to come to this and ask you about this. Should we be ignoring what's weak? Should we be ignoring... Yeah. Right. So tell us about how we work that balance. Uh, great question. I actually just published uh, part one of a two part blog, I think in October, November, December on this and what triggered me because because I know it doesn't inc it, it, like ignore weaknesses. It doesn't let people off the hook. But um, an HR friend, colleague at one of our big clients asked me, she said, you know, if we do strengths, we're going to let our executives off the hook and those behaviors that aren't working for us and we've been trying to help them with for a while, they'll be like, it doesn't matter. Here are my strengths, right? And so mm. there's that risk. Or there certainly was that risk in her mind. And it's a great question because I think a lot of people have that top of mind, which is why her question was so powerful. Strengths does not ignore weaknesses. That's a misconception. And, and here's why, just to give you something concrete for the audience. There's two ways to look at weakness. It can be a lack of skill, right? Mm -hmm. I need to, let's keep it really simple, right? Uh, Brit, lots of tea, always drinking tea. How do I work a kettle, right? You either know how to work a kettle or not. Very simple. It's hard skill. You teach someone mm -hmm. how to use it, they can use it. Really simple. Right. Um, so the, those type of skills, we need to always be learning skill and knowledge because the world's training, uh, constantly changing. We always need to be absorbing skill and knowledge. So we're not off the hook for keep learning. Right. Then what Gallup described as a weakness is something that gets in my way at work. So I did five years of French at school. I speak zero French. Maybe if I spent a year in France, some of it would come back to me. But is that a weakness for me? No, because I don't need it. At don't work. need it. We have coaches in Canada and France that speak French, right? If we need mm -hmm. French for a client, we've got coaches. So it's not a right. weakness. So think, first of all, define a weakness that gets in our way at work right? Now, it might get in our way, 
or we might cause a problem, which is another way to look at it, by a strength overdone. And let me illustrate that. My number one is maximizer. That means my talent is about constant improvement, all about quality. So whenever I look at a situation, I'm not looking at what's wrong with it. I'm looking like constant improvement. How do we take a good team to great? Mm. Now, how, how that might feel to you if you're on my team and work with you, that when you bring something to me, a great idea, and you've polished it and got a great plan, I might still be looking for ways to improve it. So you might feel, oh, there's no pleasing, Jane. Every time right. she's looking for better. So I have to watch that. So a weakness as a leader in the corporate world might be that my strength is being overdone. I'll give you another quick example because this is a very common one, Achiever. Achiever is one of the 34 and it's the most common one across the globe. Achieve is all about work ethic, getting things done, a real drive and uh, setting the pace with a team. But if I overdo that, it might feel to my team, it's all about the work and they're just mm -hmm. cogs in a wheel. And right. I see that a lot in coaching clients that they don't know the leader. The leader doesn't take the time to know them. It's all about deliverables. Well, in time, that's going to turn people off and they become disengaged or they decide to leave either is a loss for the organization. So a big part of what we see, particularly in executive coaching, is a weakness is a strength overdone. Does that resonate, Dov? Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. I think this is one of the things, that this is why I wanted to bring that up, because I think that uh, my philosophy, me, this is my philosophy, it's not the truth. My philosophy is that every strength is a weakness and every weakness is a strength. The blessing is the curse and the curse is the blessing. So, you know, uh, like you said, if you are a person who's always looking for how it can be better, you know, that, that's a great gift, except if the person who came to you thinks, oh, well, look at this, it's fantastic, I've, I've worked so hard on this, and you go, yeah, we can make it even better, and they always feel like a piece of shit, and they never feel like you, they're appreciated, and, yes. and, and I think this is what people really have to grasp, is not just that you need to work on your strengths and grow your strengths, but you actually have to monitor your strengths for how your strengths can intimidate and lose the humanity, which is what we're talking about here with another individual. And this is why emotional intelligence is so vital because emotional intelligence, as you stated earlier, uh, we think about emotional intelligence as something we learn and then we can use on people. But the truth of the matter is that emotional intelligence is something you learn to use on yourself first, and then you learn it with your people. And what that means is I have to look at how does what I do that I feel so great about actually intimidate other people. I was having a conversation with a very good friend of mine uh, many years ago, and she said to me, she said, I was talking about a relationship I had with somebody I knew who, who I was trying to build a relationship with, somebody who was a family member, and I just was never getting a connection. And I said, you know, what is it about? I mean, like, you know, I'm always nice to this person. And she said to me, you do know you're really intimidating, right? <laughs> and I went, no. And she says, yeah, you're really intimidating. And I said, how? I, I, I don't get it. And, you know, and then she started to explain. And what she explained was my personality and my strengths. And everything she was saying was like, I was like, yeah, that's good, isn't it? And she said, not if you don't consider other people. And I suddenly went, wow, that is like, that was like a massive, massive light bulb to realize that it was a double-edged sword. And I think that very often when it comes to our strengths, we look at our strengths as something that we hold up and we, you know, da -da, da -da, this is me. I'm so great. I'm a goal setter. I'm a achiever. I'm a winner. You know, I, I'm, I'm a this, I'm a that. I'm always looking for the better. Well, hold on a sec. What if that's just intimidating the crap out of everybody and doesn't allow them to connect with you. And this is why I believe I talked a lot about it in my last book, fiercely loyal, where it's so important to understand, particularly for those of us who are high achievers, that vulnerability is your greatest power of engagement. Yeah. Right. And that's the humanity piece. It, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, this, the human intelligence that I talk about, we do a program called human intelligence and there's, there's different pieces to it. And one are the strengths piece. One is the emotional intelligence piece, conversational intelligence piece and the trust piece, which is where the vulnerability that you're referencing comes in. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Don Clifton talked about, who is the father of strengths and, and, you know, was involved in the initial research, a lot of the research at Gallup 
was our strengths play out when we interact with other people. And so there is a great story that you just shared of an interaction that you were willing to have, right? You didn't mm -hmm. give up on that person trying to build that relationship. And it was like an aha moment for both of you. Because I'm, I'm wondering whether it was just as tough for her to share that with you versus avoid sharing it. And when you interacted with each other, your, your strengths, the, you shine the light on your strengths. And in this case, how maybe it was overdone in that individual. But if we, can, if we can constantly look through the lens that we're interacting with another human being, and while my strengths, yes, I'll put my hand up, these are my strengths, and yes, these really help me, but it, it's, you're still interacting with people that are very different to you. Mm -hmm. And finding ways to build trust and stay curious, to learn about who are you, who am I, how can we best work together, what is the risk? And so those are many of the practical exercises we do with clients. We have one exercise which is needs and values and, and we'll do that in a workshop where you and I might work together and talk about what my value is and my strengths and what yours are and how they're similar and how they're different and what's that played out like in the past when we've worked together and intimidation might come into it. And then what are our needs to e enable each other to thrive when we work together in the future? And it sounds so simple, right? But there's nothing, there's very little that goes on in the corporate world on a daily basis that helps us get to that level of depth mm -hmm. of knowing each other as a human being so that we can work together better. And instead, we tend to cause this, or yeah. you didn't say what you said you were going to do. Well, that's not what I meant when I said I was going to do it. And we're on two different pages. A combination of strengths and conversational intelligence really helps us improve that human intelligence. Well, let's talk about that for a moment, because uh, before we went on air, uh, you broke some news to me that uh, I didn't know. Um, uh, th a few years ago, I interviewed Judith Glacier, who wrote the book called Conversational Intelligence. You told me about her passing in, in 2018. I did not know that. Uh, you were a, a big fan of her work, and you have taken a lot of her work on and, and put it in as part of uh, Churchill and the work that you're doing. Talk to us about conversational intelligence, because I think that, you know, I, I, I loved my, my interview with her. Um, it's something I have practiced for many, many years. Let's, let's talk a little bit about how you apply it and how you get your clients to apply conversational intelligence, because it seems like one of the things I, I've, I've said around this is that uh, I, the example I give is that everybody thinks they're going to be good at relationship because everybody's automatically in relationships. Right. And I go, but why would you think you're good at it? Well, because you grow up having relationships. Yeah. But most people grow up having terrible relationships and never learn how to have a decent one. And so people think that because they can talk, they're good at communication because they can talk, they've got communication, conversational intelligence. They haven't Talk to us about how you integrate that and how you get people to, to really grasp conversational intelligence? Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, Judith's work and the world of neuroleadership, um, mm -hmm. there's been so much progress in understanding how the brain works. And uh, Judith opened my eyes to the brain isn't just this brain here, but we have five brains, different parts of our brain, our heart being a brain, our stomach being a brain. And it's interesting because we were taught, you and I were talking about Australia before we got on the call in your visit. I was first introduced that our heart and our stomach are also brains um, probably about five years ago about some mm -hmm. research in Sydney that was done that there are our stomach and heart sense of signals that, that enable us to have feelings and intuition and thoughts that lead us to have better or not so good decisions to whether whether we listen to it or not. So all of this is connected. Um, let me step back a little further of why did I choose to do the work with Judith and become certified and have, um, I, I, we have a large global team at Churchill who are certified conversational intelligent coaches. It's because most of our work at work, we're in conversations. Of course. Yeah, there are some people that are a lot on their computers, but even then they're in conversations through emails, etc. So any form of conversation, whether it's with my boss, whether it's my peers, my customers, my stakeholders, or with the team that I lead, it's all based on conversations. And the, one of the ways that Judith put it is that culture, and I think we all recognize how important having the right culture at work is, is really a reflection of the type of relationships that happen in our organization. If you want an innovative culture, then there has to be a lot of openness and collaboration and idea sharing and idea accepting and testing and all of this that goes on, right? 
those relationships are purely a product of the type of conversations that people have. Yep. So with that as a background, and then we do a lot of work with Leader as Great Coach, where we teach corporate leaders how to coach. And we mm. always talk about it. I mean, people want it to coach their teams, to develop their people, to have better conversations with the people that report to them. But really what we talk about is you can use coaching skills to have conversations across and up. It's like a, it's a full mm. circle. So you put those two together and you're like, ooh, what if we can help people have better conversations beyond just words, but really understand what's going on internally in our body? Yeah. Yes. We work with a lot of healthcare people. We work with a lot of tech people. And if we can sort of give a degree of proof around what happens from a neurochemical perspective, that why when you say certain things to me one way versus another way, I versus I'm open, mm -hmm. that's real right and so yep. you in a simplistic way you might talk about cortisol or oxytocin i can speak to you in a certain way that that draws you towards me and builds trust and i can speak about the sub same subject in a different way and i shut you down i may not recognize it but inside you're like i can't get away from this woman right mm -hmm. words create worlds and that's what we learned from judith so in terms of applying it with clients um, there's the concepts, which we, we help clients understand. And then there must be 50, 60 tools and exercises that we, we use, depending on the need. So most of our work with clients starts with what is it they're trying to change? What are they trying right. to learn? What are they trying to do better? Start with the end in mind and then work backwards. And then typically we will incorporate some conversational intelligent tools, depending on what the need is. You know, it's not like we're going out and just teaching conversational intelligence. That's Judith's team's job. But we're mm -hmm. incorporating the concepts and tools in leadership and team development based on the need. Yeah, and, and I think that this is one of the, the things that often leaders get stuck on is the, the um, IQ side of, of leadership, thinking that, you know, I'm really smart, therefore I'm a good leader. No, uh, some of the dumbest people I know are really smart. Um, <laughs> that's not actually the smartest thing to, to be. Uh, and, you know, people go, well, you know, you can't trust your gut. Yeah, well, I agree. You can't trust your gut alone, but you need to understand that your gut is in communication uh, so there's more neurons in in the heart and the stomach combined than there is in uh, in the in the brain. And what people don't understand is, you know, this is one of the things where you know I, my background is aside from psychology is that I've been a health nut since I was uh, before I was 20 years old. And looking at at, at the, the gut wall health, and people are like, oh, you know, why do you always so focus so much on that? Because for me, I know that I don't feel as good mentally as clear if my gut is up playing up and people go, well, how do you know your gut's playing up? And I can tell immediately I've eaten something and I can feel this fuzziness in my mind because the, those things are connected. So the stomach, the heart and the brain all work together. And the reason you say things like I, I don't know, I can't explain it. Um, but I don't feel good about this is because that's a gut response. There is no rationale in that gut in the, in those neurons. The neurons are, the neurons are rationale are up in the hippocampus and they're up in the frontal lobes of the brain. And that just that gut response of like, Ooh, get away from me. That is, you know, you're paying attention to that. It's, it's a phenomenal science if people would bother. Now I'm not expecting leaders to, to, to go and study that that's my personal craziness and i just love all that stuff and have done for 40 years but grasping that the humanity of who you are is not just your intellect it is your iq it is your conversational intelligence and it is paying attention to yourself at a beyond a, a level i mean we've all had the experience of getting that resume and going, this is a perfect candidate. And then sitting in front of the person and going, what happened? Right? Yep, seen that. The resume, resume is still the, still the same, but what changed? And, and as you said, can be as simple as tonality. I mean, you know, the example I used to do at the workshops, uh, at our, our, our trainings would be something like this. I'm going to say something to you and I just want you to watch how you respond. And they would go, okay. And I'd go, Jane, I love you. And just think about how you feel. And then I go, Jane, I love you. <laughs> Same <laughs> words, right? Very different response, very different feeling. And that's, again, that, that 
that actually, and we can now measure that, which is so great because we've now got the brain science to do that. So say, oh, the brain lit up completely differently with one versus the other using exactly the same words. So tonality, cadence, and all the other things, including physiology, including this, you know, the hardness of my face visually versus the softness of my face visually when I say it. So these are all part of the higher levels of understanding way we're dealing with people. And this is what we've got to get so much better at. But again, for me, it comes back to that humanity of the vulnerability because there's the job to be done. Check the box. We got to get this done. But how we get people to do it is by, as you say, tapping into those strengths and accessing those strengths by actually approaching them in the most human possible manner. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think one of the, one of the things through all of this that, has, has been a lesson for me over the years of coaching is judgment, right? We mm -hmm. all have good judgment when it comes to a business decision or how we spend cool. our time. Yeah. But we're so at risk so often of judging people and making assumptions. And when we do that and the words that come out of our mouth, the other person often feels it. And again, there's defensiveness and, and we decrease trust and we, we, we create a gap between us. And these are two people that have to work together for success versus recognizing that my thinking around what you did or didn't do or what you've said is an assumption and instead staying curious. And as we say at Churchill, double clicking to find out more, I said, I heard you say this, tell me more what that means versus I heard you say this and you're wrong and this is why, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, so, it's like a human respect for the other person that I think I knew what you said and what it meant, but hang on a minute, that's me looking through my lens. So my lens is an N of one. You come with an experience and a, a, a life that's, you're looking through a totally different lens and strengths is part of that. But let me not judge or assume, let me find out more. And because I'm curious and I'm genuinely humanly interested in you, we go deeper, we build trust, we get on the same page, and therefore we can align and be more productive when we leave the conversation. And it sounds yeah. simple on paper. It sounds simple as I'm saying Person. it. Yeah. But boy, does it happen not so often. Yeah. All the time. yeah, there's great complexity to how easy we can slip into that. I mean, uh, even at a simple level, you know, you and I originally palms, originally Brits, um, living in North America. Um, I just came back from uh, the place I used to live before I moved here, which was Australia. And, you know, uh, Bob Hope once said, uh, England and America, two countries separated by a common language. You know, Australia, England, and, and America, three countries separated by a common language. And the word can, a word can mean something different. You know, uh, in England, if you called somebody a bastard, it was incredibly insulting. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, somebody said, oh, he's a bastard. It was like, oh, that's a terrible thing to say. In Australia, it was, g'day, you bastard. It was like a good, you know, it was like, that was the thing your mate said to each other. So it's very much, you know, even, even the word and the meaning of a word can be so different. And the willingness to be curious is a big part of my work is encouraging curiosity. And I know it's a big part of yours too. Your sound has gone away. Two, one. Okay, so tell us what was the turning point in your what was the turning point in your life, in your leadership, in your business philosophy? Um, I think one of the the biggest turning points for me is when I left corporate and started Churchill. Um, another big one was when I moved from the UK to the US almost 22 years ago now. But I think from a from a business philosophy, it was moving from corporate to Churchill. And there was a lot of downsizing in the pharmaceutical industry for many, many years. And then I got the opportunity to take a package. And um, it meant that financially, I was in a good place. And prior to that, for a few years, I've been thinking about, well, I've had the opportunity to do all this different leadership work across organizations and what if I could 
harness all of that and start a company myself. So I'd already been thinking about it and tested out a few ideas before mm -hmm. starting Churchill. And then I got this great opportunity to say, oh, the universe heard me. Now I've got this great package. I can go. And the risk is low, right? Because it's scary. It was exciting, but scary. So with that, um, I made that move. But one of the reasons that I started what I started at Churchill, in addition to my love of leadership development and coaching was I truly believe, and I still believe it, there is so much untapped talent in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's unbelievable. And you think about how much of a corporate's bottom line cost is their payroll. So mm -hmm. they're paying for all these people to come to work at all different levels. And I was one of them. And we know about 33% of people are fully engaged in the US, for example, it varies across the globe. So two thirds are not as engaged as they could be. I'm like, what if you can harness that? Mm -hmm. What if you can understand people at a level enough as a leader, people on your team to truly get the best out of them for, for your benefit as a leader in the company, but just as important, if not more importantly, for their benefit, sure. so they want to go above and beyond, what would be possible if we could do that? And I already knew about StrengthsFinder. I was introduced to it and started to do it with my teams in corporate, although back then I realized I, I knew very little. Um, but I wanted to create expertise in that and global teams that could deliver it. So Strengths is our accelerator in all of our programs. And it really brings a common language about what's right with us that we can use to continue to grow and learn and, and be more effective leaders and teams. And I think the transition from corporate where I was able to dip my finger in and do bits, but I was very right. much to some degree controlled by what the company wanted us to do or resources. Now I could create a new reality where I could make decisions to really make this the priority. Mm. And I think one of the, the things I learned as a businesswoman is, and I was always on teams, part of teams, building teams. I think I've learned even more what true collaboration is. Mm -hmm. Because when coaches collaborate, they're so curious with each other and so non-judgmental and so open to finding a way for us all to move forward, the collaboration shines. And that plays out when we work with customers in terms of the outcomes they want, but what's the best right way for us to help you move forward as an organization. And it isn't just we come in and there's a meeting, there's a program in a box and you do this. It's a collaborative approach. It's a true partnership, which is why most of our clients, I think virtually all of them, we continue to work with for many years. And I think that was a shift, being able to have a, a lot more influence on truly untapping talent, right? Yes. Get to the outcomes and truly putting in collaboration and partnerships that were so much more meaningful. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate Thank that. You. We as leaders, particularly conscious leaders, um, are always committed to our growth. Uh, as successful as you are, you know, your company's done amazing things. You know, you've got, like you said, 80 plus certified people around the world. What's the one thing that you're still working on within yourself? <laughs> oh, that's such a relevant question. Um, so I'll use this because it's, it's, it's so much to it. 2018, my, my personal learning journey was patience. I am very, very driven. I, as, as we've talked about, Maximizer is all about constant improvement. So I'm looking at things and want to want to make positive change. I also have a ranger high, an activator high in my strengths. So I want to move fast. I want to be doing lots of things at once. And I realize that all the learning I've done through emotional intelligence, conversational intelligence, intuition, you know, how that plays out and listening to really, not just what my brain says to me, but really taking time to think and listen deeper to myself as well as others was um, I, I can drive myself nuts with being impatient and want to get things done tomorrow <laughs> instead of like a month from now. So um, it's amazing when you we sort of start to say out loud what you want to work on this year. And it started with me, like I had to learn patience first to offer patience to other people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's worked beautifully in terms of what I've learned. But boy, did the universe throw me lessons. You've never, like we're in the process of selling our house and now it's under contract to sell, but it's the third contract. So it's like, we're going to give you a contract and we're going to have that fall through. And we're going to make you wait a bit longer and have that. And things at home, 
things at work. We've launched a big marketing campaign to market Churchill more effectively this year. We took on government contracts, federal government work, and also wanted to automate our processes to make us more efficient. Well, that's three huge projects. Now I've learned patience. I'll be doing one project a year, major project at the most. <laughs> it's like, I think I can do more than I can, right? But it's my impatience, my active ranger maximizer that drives me. And so I think that's a life lesson. I still have to keep learning. And it's that's really beautiful. Helpful. That is beautiful. That's awesome. Uh, what, what is it that brings you joy? Um, seeing the confidence of people go up. So many people, when you're in a safe executive coaching one-on-one -on -one environment, it's a safe space, right? And so they are, mm -hmm. clients are vulnerable, which is how it should be because it's that safe sure. space. And, and you, you help them think through their situation and the best way forward. And you see the lights go off. You see it, you know, we use Zoom all the time if we're not in person. And you see the lights go off like, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I never thought of that. Oh my God. I think I can try this. And so that plays out in workshops. It plays out when we work with uh, global HR departments doing programs across, you know, all different countries across the globe. And you start to see confidence of what's possible. And that re I guess that's my maximizer of what's possible. But when mm -hmm. I see that light up in people, I know I'm in the right place. I'm doing the type of work that I was meant to be doing. Yeah, I, I agree. That's, that's, uh, it's a very joyous experience to watch somebody's lights go on when they suddenly go, Oh, I get it. I can do that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's pretty and exciting. And then you see them go do it and they come back and talk to you and it's just the pride is, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty great. Thanks. What's, what's a, uh, what's a guilty pleasure for Jane Jenkins? Besides wine. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> um, actually, I've, I've stopped drinking wine so much now because, uh, yeah. Um, yoga. Yeah. It's your guilty pleasure is yoga. Yoga. <laughs> I am. Um, I, I, I like there was one month in 2018 where I did a physical, like went to a class every day for 30 days. And I could tell the difference on my body. My body was exhausted, but stronger in ways that it had been 30 days prior. But I probably do about four classes a week of yoga. I love going on yoga retreats um, where I can interact with other people. It's more of a collective experience. And so that's my guilty pleasure. Often I'll say, you know, if, if, if I perform well in the Churchill business, then I will treat myself with this many yoga retreats in a year. And that's fabulous. So I say, yeah, I would say it's that. That's, that's a pretty good guilty pleasure. That's pretty awesome. Thank That's you. wonderful. So as we come to the end of the show, um, I want to ask you, you know, if there's something that you want our viewers, our listeners to go away with that they can put into action in the next 24, 72, maybe even as far out as a week, but they, they very practical, go do this that would have them really get what it is that you've been sharing with us today. What is it you would ask them to do? I think for it to be practical, the human intelligence, conversational intelligence, that's too big of a conversation. A real practical one is go take StrengthsFinder. It costs 15 to 20, well, it costs $20 on the Gallup website. Um, go take it, if you've already taken it, pull out your results and find a way to make it practical. Because although 20 million people have taken it, we started Churchill to turn that knowledge into practical application. Mm -hmm. So um, there's ways to do it on your own. There's ways to do it with your team. If you need external help, obviously Churchill will help you. That's what we're here for. But that is good insight into the best of you and how you can apply it. So go back to your results if you've taken it. Sit down with a print it off. Sit down with a highlighter and read your results and think about what you've got to deliver in the next month. And practically practice using some of your top five to make to help you do that. Make it a conscious practice effort. If you haven't taken it, take it and do the same. If you need yeah, help, that's... contact us. So please tell our viewers and our listeners where they can find out more about you and all the wonderful resources that you offer. Thank you. You can go to Churchill, so that's churchilleadershipgroup.com. There is a contact 
page on there where we can learn more about you and your need if you need help. There's also lots of free resources, blogs, videos on there to you can learn more. They're, they're very sort of educational and more about our services. And we actually have now well over 100 coaches around the world. So if you're a corporation, we've built that footprint to serve big organizations like eBay and American Express across the world globally, culturally. So whether you're an individual or a corporation, um, that's where you can find us. And uh, typically the first step, if you really need our help, is a 30 minute conversation with me. And I work, help you work through your need to figure out what we need to best do together. Well, Jane, this has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for all that you've shared. It's been fabulous. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, like, like we, you just said, you can find out more about Jane, Jane Jenkins at churchillleadershipgroup.com. And uh, you can reach out to her. Of course, we will put that in the show notes and you'll be able to find that there too. It's been a pleasure and honor having you on the show. I hope you'll stay with us till the end. And I want to remind you, you, dear listener, you're very welcome. Thank you. And I want to remind you, dear listener, that you can chat about this show or any of our previous shows with other listeners by going to our Facebook group page, Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. Just go on there and have a chat. Remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing even the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive, in that these fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize that they're spending a fortune attracting, training, and developing talent, only to have them leave at an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing in training and developing your talent, or have them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide you with the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside your organization by by tapping into purpose, fullmontyleadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. Also remember to stop by the matrix, matrix matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need the triple W, just matrix like the movie, fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197. It's absolutely free to you. Remember, you can now get us on Alexa and Google Google Play by simply saying Play Dove Baron Podcast. Thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how your strengths, the ones that you see, may actually be your weakness in helping you deal with other people. And also stay curious about other people's strengths in rather than, and focus in on those rather than focusing in on the weaknesses. I'm Dov Varon and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.